But today, you know, I know that this um, academy has a data, you know, audience with a data science background. So I, I like to talk a little bit on just to give you a flavor on this work we've been doing in the past few years on probabilistic computing, which has got a lot of relevance to quantum computing and machine learning. So it's an interdisciplinary um, uh, um, topic that hopefully will connect to some of the things that you know. And I put this magnetic nano devices in code so that, you know, I, I promise I won't get too technical on things that might be a little bit uh, outside of your scope and interests. So I, as Murat mentioned, I've recently joined UC Santa Barbara. I have this lab that we're, you know, we're a, a interdisciplinary lab. We work on algorithms for artificial intelligence, as well as a strong hardware background. And I've got this, you know, bunch of bright uh, uh, students who are working with me. So this is not a one person effort, but really a, a collective effort of, of all of us. Now, let me begin by saying a few words on where computing is today. Okay, so you are, of course, all familiar with bits that everything you do in digital computing in software or hardware is really being enabled by this abstraction, this notion of a bit. And a bit is really this object that's um, zero or one. And um, uh, it's, this, it's this thing that's always deterministic. You're either zero or you're one, and this is this abstract thing. But we express and realize bits in hardware using these amazing semiconductor devices that's been developed over the past five, six decades. So you've got the CPU, you hear about GPUs, and now even more specific things like the tensor processing unit or, or TPU. And, and the key thing about these things uh, is that they've got billions and billions of transistors in them. It's really this unbelievable technology that's been scaled to these enormous densities. Now, on some other extreme, you hear about qubits, okay? These quantum mechanical objects or, or qubits. Now, even to describe what a qubit is, you get in a little bit of trouble because you can't just say a qubit is an object that can be zero and one at the same time. That wouldn't be quite right. So what we say is it's a superposition or a complex uh, a linear combination of this bit zero and bit one. But the thing is that since it started as a conceptual field, there's a lot of activity in trying to build quantum computers in hardware. Of course, uh, there's a lot of this, these companies are in Silicon Valley, but it's really a worldwide effort that a lot of big major players are trying to build qubits. Now, th this might seem uh, uh, unrelated to what's happening in bits, but an emerging notion in the field is in electronics is that these are becoming domain specific. Things are not being general purpose anymore, but they're really becoming domain specific. And what that means is unlike the early days where we used to make better transistors to make everything better. Now the trend is to take a specific task, say in machine learning, for example, matrix multiplication, and then make it faster or better by building specific devices for it. And GPUs and TPUs are really in this category. Now, quantum computing also is in this category because quantum computing, quantum computers are not meant to replace your digital computers completely, but they are meant to solve some specific tasks more efficiently compared to uh, digital or classical computers. Okay, so things are becoming more domain specific as we go along. Now, today, what I'll tell you a little bit about in this next you know, 30, 35 minutes is that is, is this idea of P bits. And, and they're really in this spectrum, they're really in between bits and qubits. Now, they're not coherent or they're not really quantum mechanical. So they're really, you know, in some sense classical, but they're not deterministic either. They fluctuate. So instead of being zero or one, deterministically, they fluctuate between zero and one randomly. Okay, so this is a really good building block, as I'll explain, for a lot of these stochastic or probabilistic applications. Now, this is also a domain specific field that the p-bit is not meant to be a substitute for the qubit, or it's not meant to completely replace the bit, but it's really a good building block for a lot of these probabilistic computing applications. And if you look into machine learning, especially statistical mechanics, this physics inspired the, uh, part of machine learning, you see a lot of connections. And similarly, for near-term quantum computation, p-bits seem to have a lot of relevant connections, okay? 
Now, uh, let me just, before continuing, let's say, let me first give you a few, just a quick primer on computer science, just to establish the language a little bit, that with bits, you know, in computer science, it's very important when you build something like a bit, it's important to sort of match their function, their match function to form. What I mean by that is if, you're, if your building block is deterministic, it's really good for naturally deterministic applications. You're, if you're trying to multiply two very big numbers, bits are going to be very useful for that because they're going to be able to do it deterministically and reliably. On the other hand, quantum bits, for example, are good for applications that are naturally quantum mechanical. For example, simulating the electronic structure of some molecule. Okay, so qubits will be useful for that. So with that, you can sort of categorize the types of applications that will be good for p-bits. And those are really naturally probabilistic applications like, you know, doing some logistics problem, doing some probabilistic inference, looking at some noisy data and try, try to understand what's going on. Now in computer science, people will often say that, you know, there's an energy to solve a problem and sorry, there's, there's an energy to solve a problem and there's a delay to solve a problem. Now there are two really important factors here that one of them is really entirely hardware dependent, which is these prefactors that is T naught and E naught. And, and the other part is really problem and algorithm dependent, which has nothing to do with the hardware that you're solving the problem. So in computer science, people will talk about this computational complexity or scalability. For example, if I double the size of my problem, how long does it take for me to solve that problem? That's really independent of where you solve the problem, right? So that's more like a mathematical property of the problem. On the other hand, in computer architecture or in hardware, which is closer to my field, people would very much worry about the prefactors that at what architecture are you running this algorithm or, or what type of technology, what technology node are you running this? Et cetera, et cetera, okay? But in real life, of course, both of them are important because in any practical situation, somebody has to pay the bill in terms of delays or energies. Now, you've heard about Moore's law probably and the idea that transistors get better and better and better, that's really all about reducing the energy and delay in this computer architecture sense. That Moore's law is nothing to do with algorithms. It's really trying to take the same FON, for example, and trying to make it better by building better transistors. Now, probabilistic computing is really going to be about reducing these prefactors, okay? Probabilistic computing and deterministic computing are not going to change the algorithm-dependent scalability, these F of Ns and G of Ns, but they will really all be all about changing these prefactors. Now, one big difference with quantum computing is in quantum computing, the idea is a little bit different. They try to find, because it's so difficult to build quantum computers and they have such high E naughts and tau naughts, they can't really make this argument that they, they, the only way out for quantum computing is that find an algorithm that, that runs scales better on the quantum computer than uh, on, on classical computers. And a really striking example of this is the Shor's algorithm, Shor's factoring algorithm. It's just, it takes an exponential dependence and turns it into a logarithmic dependence. It's about a, a striking change you can see in the uh, uh, scalability of the problem as it gets, okay? So, so there's this subtle, these subtle differences between qubits and p-bits, and we don't really mean to imply that you don't need quantum computers. Certain problems really do need quantum compu computers, but on the other hand, many of them don't, okay? So that's gonna be the um, uh, uh, keynote here. So what can you do with, okay, it's all interesting and abstract, but what can you do? What are these applications that are, that are useful for qubits? Well, uh, there are two, as I mentioned in the beginning, they're really quantum computing inspired and machine learning inspired applications. And in quantum computing inspired categories, you have this, a difficult inverse problems, okay? So in computer science, it's well known that certain problems are harder in one direction than the other, okay? So the easiest one is multiplication. Multiplication is fairly easy, but division is a little bit harder. And in fact, factorization, meaning let's say I give you a factor, I give you a, a number like 21 and ask you to find the factors of that uh, in terms of primes that turns out to be a, a much more difficult problem, especially if these numbers get large. So um, this, with p-bits, it turns out you can solve, you can find an efficient way of mapping these problems, these inverse problems, and solve them using hardware. 
Okay, and and I'll sh I'll show you an example of that for factorization, which is done through multiplication. We'll build a multiplier that will run in reverse. Now um, there is this big category, fundamental category of computationally hard problems in CS, and th these are, for example, the famous one. The famous example is the traveling salesperson problem, where you have a traveling salesperson and they have to visit, let's say, a thousand cities in the state of California, and they they have to visit every city uh, exactly once and then come back to their starting point. So how do you minimize their distance? Now, it turns out this is a really difficult problem. And it, it, there are efficient probabilistic algorithms to solve these problems. And whenever you have a naturally probabilistic algorithm, the p-bit becomes a useful building block. Okay. And by the way, that, that tour takes about 15,000 miles to, to visit a thousand cities or you know, small towns in, in California, in case you're curious. That's not the optimal solution, but that's probably very close. So uh, another area, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, is this, you know, this might, be, this might be a little bit of a news to you if you're not familiar with this, is that some of the quantum systems themselves can be emulated and, and simulated by p-bits, okay? This isn't meant to be obvious, but some of the uh, a subset of the quantum computing uh, framework can be efficiently emulated by, by, by p-bits. Um, now, uh, in machine learning, which you may be more familiar, whenever you have probabilistic nodes, like in Bayesian or belief networks, where there are probabilistic nodes that interact with each other and that sort of communicate by one another by influencing each other. Again, p-bits become a shoo-in. They become this natural fit. And this is the, called the inference problem. When you're doing this probabilistically, it gets very, very difficult. So hardware acceleration through p-bits is really becoming, uh, it becomes a, a, a good, good, good target there. And and the more difficult learning, you know, which is another major problem of machine learning, and in, 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 in specifically in cases of Boltzmann machines, where you have these stochastic neural networks that try to learn using contrastive divergence algorithms, p-bits become a natural uh, fit for, for such naturally probabilistic applications. Okay, so this is sort of the broad overview of the types of things that you can do with p-bits if you can find an efficient way of you know, building them in, in hardware. Now, let me, so, so what is it? Let me make it a little bit more concrete. So p-bit, if you're familiar with, you know, this, this concept from machine learning, is really a binary stochastic neuron in hardware. So, well, if you're not familiar, well, what is a binary stochastic neuron? It's, it's this object where there's an analog input uh, and then there's a digital output at the activation level. Okay, so the way it looks is, but of course the digital output is probabilistic. So the way it looks is, for example, if your analog input is zero, then you get this bit stream that is fluctuating between plus ones and minus ones as a function of time. And you get uh, this 50-50 probabilities of being up or being down, okay? And um, if you change the analog input to plus one or minus one, then you're really changing this duty cycle or the probability of outputting a plus one or minus one, but you still get a random output that is always plus one or minus one. And you can plot this like this. You go from minus four to plus four. You'll see that at some point it becomes like a deterministic bit, but then in the middle, it becomes this fluctuating object. Okay, and sometimes we write it mathematically like this. That's really comparing the, a random number with uh, the hyperbolic tangent or the sigmoid function that you may be familiar with, and then taking the sign of it so that you always get a plus one or minus one. But on average, this object behaves like this uh, sigmoidal neuron with continuous analog probabilities. Okay, so that's really it. That's really what a p-bit is. And what about a p-computer? Well, you have to connect them in some way and make a neural network. And, and so here you take, for example, n of them, and then you take their outputs. And this equation might be very familiar to you because this is very widely used in neural networks. So you have a graph and you have a sort of interconnection matrix in this JIJ. You collect the output of these p-bits, and then you bring in um, you you make you you generate this analog input that's routed back to the pivots, and this goes this runs in real time, evolves as a function of time, as this stochastic neural network, and that really is the essence of a, a p computer or a or a probabilistic computer. Okay, and and there are some technical details here that I'm not going to get into, which is this is a clockless 
architecture, if you're familiar with digital circuits, there's always a clock. That's like a traffic sign in your, in your flow, which regulates everything. This is clockless, so it's much more nature and biologically inspired. So it basically you know, fires without any regulation. And um, this is a massively parallel architecture that a key performance metric increases with the increasing number of qubits. And it requires fast communication because, you know, uh, let me say this quickly, that because there are two time constants here uh, for the qubit to calculate an output given an input and for the synapse to calculate this summation given the qubit output. So the, the communication needs to be fast. So for example, if I'm talking to one of you and I change my mind before my state gets to you, then that kind of doesn't work. So when I change my mind, it needs to get to you quickly. So these are related to the computer architecture of the problem, which are slightly technical, but every single example I, I, I've talked about and I'm always showing really belongs to this architecture, okay? That's it, that's really it. So um, now let me show you an example where you can see how this works, okay? So it's, it's a, consider this to be a very, don't worry about the resistor. This is just a very abstract way of doing the simplest correlated P-bit circuit, okay? So this is the simplest P-bit circuit where you've got two outputs, VM1 and VM2. And suppose we connect them, we connect the output of one to the input of the other and output of the other to the back, back to the input of the first one, okay? So let's say that we have this, this is a very simple two node neural network. And let's say that we observe this, the behavior of this as a function of time. Now consider this case, first of all, let's label the outputs VM1 and VM2 like this. So that for example, if both of them are one, one, then we put a dot here as a function of time. And let's say that the connections are zero in the beginning. They're not talking to each other at all. And let's say that this evolves as a function of time. Well, if they're both random and they're not talking to each other, what do you expect? You expect all four possibilities to be visited with, um, uh, equal probabilities, right? So as a function of time, this goes uh, 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 visiting all four possibilities. And if you looked at the probability after some time, you would see that this system behaves as if it visits all four possibilities with, uh, with equal time. So it's basically two random objects that are not talking to each other. Now, what happens if I make the connection slightly larger? Now, suppose when VM1 is positive or plus one, it, it sends an input to the second one it, and it asks the second one to be positive. So, and similarly, the second one sends a, if it's let's say plus one, it sends a plus input to the first one. So in this case, you see the system has a tendency to visit the zero, zero and one, one states a little bit more than the zero, one and one, zero states. Because whenever one of them happens to be randomly, let's say minus one or zero, then it, it, it slightly causes the other one to follow it. So you see this interesting change in the system. Now your system sort of emphasizes certain probabilities and de-emphasizes certain other probabilities. And you can, for example, throw in an inverter here. This is just a logical knot. So in this case, they wanna disagree with each other and you see the system visits the one zero state more often than it stays, is, visits the zero one state. Okay, so this is sort of the simplest example where you can show how two noisy objects as a, as a hardware neural network can visit these different states and, and solve the different probabilities, resolve different probability distributions. Okay, so um, this was two states, two, two neurons, and that gave us four states. Now, I, I'd like you to sort of appreciate if it was three, it was just four neurons, then you would have had uh, uh, 16 states. If it was you know, six neurons, then it, you would have had 64 states and so on and so forth. So this grows, this exponentially explodes. If I have a hundred neuron system, then I'm really living in a unimaginably large two to the 100 space. So this is really this, exponentially large space that your P computer lives in, okay? So this isn't too different from a quantum computer where you also live in a two to the N space. There are subtle differences, but in essence, they really live on this giant enormous space. Now, um, th there are some, these probabilities you can sort of uh, uh, calculate. They're really related to the energy of the system. So this is a very, very much physics inspired neural network idea where you have an energy that sort of whose, expon whose negative exponential gives you probabilities. 
and uh, you can sort of design these energies beforehand so that your probabilistic computer goes and solves a problem. For example, this high peak here, these twin towers in this, in this example could be the solution that you're looking for in a, let's say, learning problem or a search problem. Now, this idea actually dates back to Feynman 1982. Now, in 1982, Feynman wrote this very famous article. Actually, it was a keynote talk that he gave. And he introduced the idea of a quantum computer. And you'll hear this paper from Feynman in the context of quantum comp computation very frequently. What's much less well known is, in that very same paper, actually Feynman described what I've been trying to tell you about probabilistic computers. He said, you know, if you're trying to simulate a probabilistic nature, you should most efficiently use a probabilistic computer. That's really the, you know, if you get one thing out of this talk, that would be the, the, the line. Okay, so uh, let me now uh, quickly say a few words on how do you build now, where the hardware comes in. Now, PBIT is an abstraction. Everything I've been telling you so far about the PBIT could have you know, 20, 25 different hardware implementations. And same with the qubits. You hear about, for example, semiconductor qubits, uh, like single electron transistor qubits, superconducting qubits, et cetera, et cetera. So similar story with qubits. There are many ways to build a qubit, which harnesses the inherent noise in, in the environment. But there is one that's very special, and that goes back to magnetism, okay? So this is, this is the magnetism part of uh, this idea. Now, remember, we're trying to build this. We're trying to build this object that gives us a tunable stochasticity. And, um, and um, uh, uh, you have a ferromagnet where um, you, you, you have a ferromagnet. Now, this is a toy model for a ferromagnet, okay? So imagine there's a ferromagnet where there are two states that are separated by, let's say, 40 kT or so. And this is, if you're not you know, familiar with this, don't, don't worry about it. It just says that if you, if, when you design a magnet for memory applications, you try to fix the magnet in one direction so that it acts like a bit. It, it stays there and it, it's kind of stuck there. Okay, and, and people will often say that uh, uh, if you design that energy barrier large enough, your energy, your, your, your magnet is gonna stay there for a number of years. So for example, your fridge magnet is staying there for, for 10 years because it's got a high energy barrier between those two states. Now for the p-bit, the, the thing with exponentials is if you reduce that energy barrier of the magnet to around the kT or so, so that the energy barrier becomes comparable to the uh, 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 thermal energy in the system, which is always there, you know, anything, any, any wet system, anything that's, that's uh, 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 at room temperature has, has, has this thermal noise in the background. So if you reduce the energy barrier of your magnet to the thermal noise, then it stops, it starts jumping up and down between these two states. So imagine a fridge magnet that changes its state from north to south every picoseconds or nanoseconds. Okay, so it's, it's kind of this really interesting behavior regime that you enter. And we have this magnetic tunnel junction device, which is, you know, again, I, you, don't worry about it if, you, if you're not familiar with this. This is a nano device that sort of turns these magnetic fluctuations into resistance fluctuations. So suddenly you can have a resistance which is changing from 10 kilo ohms to 20 kilo ohms as a function of time every picoseconds or so. And this is the craziest thing. I don't know if you've done any you know, electrical measurements before, but you go and you buy a resistor and you measure its resistance, let's say it's 10 kilo ohms, okay? That's very normal. Everyone I'm, I'm sure has, you know, has done that or knows, you know, uh, is familiar with that idea. But here you have this object, which is a nano junction, where you try to measure its resistance and it's this, you're not applying anything and the resistance goes back and forth between 10 kilo ohms and 20 kilo ohms, okay? So this is really harnessing the thermal noise that is ever present to get this randomness for free. So this is really at the heart of a compact uh, P-bit hardware that you can build because these magnetic tunnel junctions are these extremely scaled, very small nano devices. And in fact, uh, uh, memory industry have put about a billion of these uh, magnetic tunnel junctions for memory applications. So this hasn't been done for p-bits, but for memory applications, this is a real technology, and you 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 know uh, it's it's coming uh, it's becoming a reality. It's it's probably going to be in our chips. 
in the next five to 10 years, maybe even before, where you have these magnetic bits that sort of remember your information. But remember, these are like your fridge magnets. They're gonna be stable. Now, what we proposed uh, uh, a few years ago was that, hey, if you could put a billion of those on chip, why don't you make those unstable like the ones that I showed you? Why don't you, and this, this can be done by these magnet engineering. You can design the magnet in such a way that the, you know, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, free layer has a, uh, basically a uh, smaller energy barrier, and then you get these fluctuations for free. And with, you know, with a few circuit tricks in a highly, you know, compact um, uh, circuit, you can get something that looks like on the right, which is this tunable randomness that I've been telling you from the beginning, right? This is the binary stochastic neuron that, that's useful in your stochastic neural network. And, and you can get that with these only three transistors and one MTJ. Now you have to understand one thing that getting random numbers, it might feel very natural to you in software. If you're designing, let's say you are training some neural network and you needed a million random numbers and you just call your library in PyTorch or whatever and, and it gives you a million random numbers. Now in the background, there's a very big computation that you're paying for that. It's in, in fact, very expensive to generate random numbers. And in fact, part of the reason stochastic neural networks are not as uh, 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 widespread pervasive in machine learning is because of this, that they're computationally expensive. They require typically more than a thousand, if not tens of thousands of transistors. So to get that with three transistors and an MTJ in a chip that can have a billion such units, is really the key point, the excitement here, okay? So that, that's, the, that's the basic bottom line of this idea. Now we've built this device, we've made a prototype that we published uh, in 2019. Uh, so we've had these eight such stochastic magnetic tunnel junctions. We collaborated with you know, world experts on fabricating and, and building these stochastic magnetic tunnel junctions. And um, uh, this is, this is our chip. This is two centimeters or around, you know, around an inch, 0.8 inches or whatever. And this is, this is actually eight such MTJs in the same computer architecture that I've shown you earlier. Okay, this is literally the same stochastic neural network where these P bits or binary stochastic neurons are talking to one another, but they also use the inherent thermal noise in the background. So you can see as a function of this input parameter V in, you see this change and, uh, in, in the volt, in the output characteristics, basically the tunable uh, randomness property that we wanted. So we've, we've uh, uh, solved problems with this because this is naturally an energy minimizer. It naturally does your stochastic gradient descent for you that you, you're very familiar in machine learning. So we took an example from the field of um, um, uh, uh, quantum computing, okay? So this is a subfield of quantum computing. In quantum computing, this integer factorization problem has been looked at by various different ways. This isn't the famous Shor's algorithm type factoring, but this is another approach where uh, you have, you treat the factoring problem as an optimization problem. You say that, okay, I have this function E that I'm trying to minimize. I have a factor F that I'm trying to factor. And if my uh, input X and Y multiply to F, then X, Y minus F will be zero and this energy will be minimal. Any other X and Y that do not multiply to F will give me a larger energy. That's it. So if you could minimize this, then you would find the factors. Okay, so, so you write the X and Y in binary, like you do, like you express any number in, in binary in, in, you know, and you do this and you write down a synapse, you find the, basically the neural network that'll get the job done. It's a one-time efficient process. And then in experimental work, you have to calibrate, okay? So, so you calibrate your system. Remember the example where I showed they were not talking to each other. So all probabilities were equal, if you remember. So that's what you do. You calibrate your system of eight P bits and they, you take a long time average, it's a 20 second average and X and Y are the factors that, that correspond to, you know, the, the correct factors will be among those possibilities. So in the beginning, you correlate, you, you calibrate your system when they're uncorrelated. And then you basically turn on the interactions like we did previously. And 
you see after tens or 20 seconds, when these fluctuations kind of settle, or you take, you take an average of 20 seconds of fluctuations, then you find the correct factors of, a, of an integer that you picked. Okay, so this system, you're not doing anything, you're just letting it evolve in time and it minimizes this energy function, which is a very common operation in neural networks, as you know, this energy minimization, and it does it uh, uh, stochastically. It does it, it, it has this built-in noise that could be useful in this process. Okay, so, so this is what a P-computer does. It's, it's a natural energy minimizer, and to do it with these uh, stochastic MTJs, that can be integrated with CMOS in billion bit densities can really enable new frontiers for the next wave of uh, artificial intelligence. Now, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning, this factoring is an inverse multiplication problem. Now, this is slightly technical, but I, I still want to, you know, it's such an intriguing idea that I wanted to show you this. Now, this is what you're looking at is um, uh, uh, a, a multiplier circuit. Okay, this is nothing but schoolbook multiplication. How do you multiply two binary numbers? Well, you do bitwise end. So you multiply every number by every number bitwise, and then you sort of add them up. So this FA means a full adder. That does the addition. Another FA, another FA. As you remember, we used to shift. You know, how would you multiply? You would shift the numbers and you would add them up after the bitwise multiplication. That's it. Now, this circuit can multiply numbers. You build this with p bits, okay? Remember, these AND gates are now p AND, full adders are p full adders. So these are the probabilistic generalization of the AND or NOT gates that you, you learned in high school about, you know, basic logic gate. But these are now probabilistic. Now, what you can do with this is you can do multiplication, but you can also fix the output to a value because of the architecture of this thing. You could fix the output to a value like 100 and, or, or this enormous number you fix this output to this enormous number. And then as a function of time, your circuit goes and finds the consistent factors that would multiply to that number. So this is a self-organization principle, you see. You see that, you say that, okay, my factor is something in the 4 billion. My output is this thing. So can you find the factors that kind of uh, multiply to this number. And again, it's a giant energy minimization problem. And as a function of time, the pivot can do this. And this is an active field where um, people try to improve this, do this better. Let me tell you that before you, know, you have questions about this, this isn't meant to break factoring or this isn't meant to factor much larger numbers. There are far better algorithms than this that can multi factor much larger numbers. Here, it's really a benchmark to sort of kind of calibrate your energy minimizer to see how, diff how it can solve difficult problems. So there are some stats here that we compare. For example, we compare with D-Wave, a quantum computing company, where we are you know, able to factor much larger numbers than what they could with their hardware. So this is already showing promise in doing state-of-the-art optimization because D-Wave over the years really became a state-of-the-art uh, optimizer. Okay, now this is, these are the last two or three slides. Uh, I, I wanna you know, keep it short in case you have questions. So uh, in the beginning, I, I mentioned that you have this delay parameter that, that has a you know, algorithmic component and you have this prefactor component. Now with bits, you can of course solve these problems. You can go and you know, simulate every single thing that I've shown you in your i9 processor or in, in Google Colab or whatever. But the thing is, if you do it with qubits, you can actually improve that time. If you can have an effective clock frequency, maybe that's four orders of magnitude better than what, what you can do with bits, okay? So this is the vision. This is why we're interested in building this hardware and trying to uh, uh, put as many qubits as, as we can. And I did tell you about the Shores algorithm. I didn't tell you about Grover search, which is another famous quantum algorithm where there was this scalability change. Something that was exponential on a quantum comp a classical computer was becoming, let's say logarithmic on a, on a uh, classical uh, quantum computer. So fault tolerant and scaled quantum computers have that promise. They can literally deliver things that would take a lifetime to solve in classical computers. They can deliver these problems in seconds or, or, or microseconds or much faster. So maybe an apt analogy is to say, 
if your bits are cars, then P bits could be fast cars, but qubits are doing something qualitatively different. Okay, they're like they're there. You, you're, you're taking a plane to a remote island that you couldn't otherwise go. But the thing I'd like to emphasize is in a world where you need airplanes, in a world where you have cars and airplanes, you always want faster cars. Okay, so the the thing with qubits is their application space is unique and. Even if people build fault tolerant scale quantum computers that solve certain problems much faster, the argument will be that uh, uh, you'll always need uh, p bits to, to solve these problems faster. Okay. And the other thing I'd like to mention oh, and uh, uh, let me tell you that the, this, the, this connection between p bits and qubits is really robust. In fact, recently we've written a paper. Uh, and uh, this is on archive if you're interested about the in the details. Um, uh, we've written a paper where we've shown that you can even solve Shor's algorithm or Grover's search with qubits. You can do this emulation. It's not a problem. It's just that it becomes exponentially hard for qubits. Okay, so yes, you can express, you can do, you can write down equations and and systems and neural networks to solve any quantum problem with stochastic neural networks, and that's a, not an obvious statement at all. Okay, so in a, a few years back, you would have a hard time, you know, uh, uh, convincing a quantum computer expert about that statement. But that's absolutely true that you can express and simulate any quantum problem with qubits. The catch is it takes an exponentially long amount of time. Okay, so you can't do, you can't, you know, completely give up on the dream of building airplanes uh, because uh, uh, qubits are, are just unreachable in, in some regimes by pivot. However, uh, uh, I, as you, th there's also a lot of hype in this field. And after giving such a good, uh, such a um, uh, optimistic and, and friendly vision for quantum computing, I must, I must tell you that you're going to, as data science experts, you probably hear about quantum machine learning, quantum internet, and even, you know, these sophisticated exotic optimization schemes. They are, they do not have these established, apologize, they do not have these established, provably better improvements. I gave you an example of the Shor's algorithm, which took something that was an exponential and made it a logarithmic dependence. But in quantum machine learning, quantum internet, or all these various exotic optimization schemes, people do not have such established improvements. And in such cases, it looks like people are trying to build flying cars rather than airplanes. Okay, so you have to, as, uh, as Scott Aronson, an expert in quantum computing says, you have to read the fine print and understand that uh, uh, anything that's going to be relevant for machine learning isn't coming anytime soon from quantum computing. That you can, you can be sure. And, and feel free to disagree with me and we can have uh, questions on that. Okay, so, all right, last slide. Uh, I, I told you, I tried to give you, give you a flavor about this um, uh, P computing, probabilistic computing with P bits, which are really in between bits and qubits in a, in a very formal concrete sense. And P bits have applications on machine learning. You can do, you can uh, hopefully uh, accelerate building, you know, better models with stochastic neural networks with P bits. And qubits also have relevance to quantum computing in terms of solving the same applications like solving difficult optimization problems much faster, for example, to give, to, to give an example. And as I said, qubits have many implementations. We've looked at CMOS hardware, FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, CMOS ASICs are things we're interested in building. We think I told you a little bit about these magnetic nano device, which is this exotic device where you, you use or you leverage the existing thermal noise to get free fluctuations. And all, also other emerging devices where you have uh, uh, creative ideas to use uh, analog uh, devices, analog noise, then they could make good pivots. And uh, we, we hope for a future where we talk about a pivot supremacy or a pivot advantage, where you beat classical computers and you solve a problem that is otherwise not solvable by our current technology. And uh, I gave you the vision for this magnetic nano devices because we, we, we like them because they've been scaled up to these enormous densities. Okay, so there is a, there is a real vision that can take us to these 
extremely high performances that, that can be useful for machine learning and AI. And finally, the final thought is, what problems or algorithms should we accelerate? What could we do with, with PBIT or qubit or with bits? And the, the answer will always be, you should match form to function. So if you are if a natural qubit, you should naturally solve and go for naturally quantum problems. And the thing is, machine learning is more naturally probabilistic and statistical than uh, quantum mechanical. Okay, so that's the that's the keynote. And for uh, probabilistic computing, uh, look for naturally stochastic applications. And as I've been saying, uh, ML and optimization are full of such examples. So um, with that. I'd like to uh, uh, conclude and thank you very much for your attention. And I'll take questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kerem. There are some questions if you look at the Q&A. Okay. Um, let's see. It was a very nice talk. Thank you. I thank learned you. a lot today. That's, that's great. Thanks. I, uh, it was, I hope it wasn't too quick. So. Since so the first question is, let me quickly read it. Since quantum computers always have thermal noise, uh, is it possible to have an algorithm that's hybrid between a quantum algorithm and a probabilistic computer algorithm? It's, uh, it's an excellent question. It's a, a very deep question. It's a research level question, which is, yes, this is correct because a quantum computer can always be made to work as a probabilistic computer. It would be an expensive way of building a probabilistic computer, but if your quantum computer isn't working due to thermal noise or inherent noise that comes from cosmic rays or whatever, then uh, 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 it would functionally work like a probabilistic computer. So the interesting part is when you have a functional quantum computer and a functional probabilistic computer, can they have some sort of hybrid collaboration to solve a problem where they each do things that come naturally to them. And this is an area that uh, is very exciting and, and we are investigating such options. So the, the answer is uh, in the affirmative. Yes, this is very much possible and, and we are thinking about it. Um, so I'll move to the next question. Can you please explain some more about how a probabilistic computer would be used for combinatorial optimization? I didn't understand your example with the multiplier impl implemented with P-logic. Now, um, let me say, say this, that uh, combinatorial optimization, as, as you know very well, uh, uses a lot of um, algorithms that are probabilistic. For example, you, many of you have heard of uh, the simulated annealing algorithm, where you have a complicated energy landscape, you throw in some noise and then you make a decision based on uh, that noise, whether you should flip. Sometimes you make inferior decisions, you increase your energy, but that gets you out of local minima. If you do this slow enough, then you get to the a, a extreme ground state. So what we do is in the case of combinatorial optimization, we first encode the problem of combinatorial optimization into a um, neural network, into a neural network whose energy corresponds to this complex landscape with non-convex wiggles and local minima and traps. After that, we apply something like a simulated annealing algorithm or its flavors like parallel tempering or many other uh, uh, probabilistic algorithms. And remember that the noise that these algorithms need really come for free for the probabilistic computer. So that's how you implement these naturally probabilistic algorithms to solve such combinatorial optimization problems with P computers, okay? Um, uh, the, the final question is, uh, it says, can a probabilistic computer be emulated with a conventional computer using pseudo random numbers? Yes, it absolutely can be. And in fact, we do this all the time to, to simulate uh, probabilistic computers. The catch is, as I've said, generating large amounts of tunable or adjustable probabilistic numbers, bits, isn't very easy. And if you, you, you get this, once you um, start doing hardware, you'll, you realize that anytime you ask for a, let's say, Mersenne twister, uh, random, pseudo random number, there is this enormous activity that goes on in the background. So that sort of limits your speed, throughput, area, and the types of things that you can do with conventional computers. So even though you can sort of emulate probabilistic computers with uh, uh, conventional computers, it makes sense to sort of build domain-specific hardware 
to really try to scale them up so that it can be useful for, let's say, uh, machine learning models and optimization problems in artificial intelligence. Okay, so, so yeah, the answer is also yes. So these are all very good questions, by the way. I uh, thank you very much for these excellent questions. Karam, I have also a couple of questions. Yeah, please, yeah. So when you show here 10 to the 16 flips per second for qubits, and it has a 10 to the 4 improvement, does it directly translate uh, into the like performance? Like, as, does it mean our, the computers will have 10 to the 4 times much uh, other processing speeds? Yes, yes, uh, it absolutely will. Now I should mention, in fact, I should have mentioned that this is a projected number. We haven't done it, okay? The prototype we've shown was with sm slow MTJs on a much slow, smaller scale. So 10 to the six flips per second. And, you know, uh, just to tell everyone that, you know, uh, in theory, of course, these are all okay. But when you do things practically, this 10 to the six has a big red line on it that it's projected, it's not experimental. However, in this field of magnetism, there's been an enormous activity in people. We've been at this for a while and people, magneticians really responded to our challenge and they've really now can build these magnetic tunnel junctions that are scaled up to these 1GD densities. And they've made it, they've made these magnetic tunnel junctions flip every nanoseconds or so. So this 10 to the 16 flip now is a million bits flipping every nanosecond, right? And, and uh, uh, that would be 10 to the 15. So if you had 10, 10 million uh, bits, that would be really within the realm of technology. And 10 million is nothing in this game because you see this is uh, one GB, it's a thousand million bits. So experimentally, I think you know, technology is there. Now your question though is, does it really, am I going to see it on my end as a user as I type up my neural network and start to train it? We believe yes, because a lot of the stochastic neural networks have fallen out of favor in machine learning because these things are so hard to train. You need a lot of random numbers. You need to run them for a very long time. And people have found other ways. For example, Boltzmann machines is a great example where people said, you know, Boltzmann machine is a great thing, but it's just that the current hardware can't really uh, 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 deal with it. So people have went to restricted Boltzmann machines and another model. So we think that this will really uh, raise interest and people will come back and see older things that didn't work could uh, work in, in new and improved ways. But as I said, the 10 to the 16 is projection at, the, at, at this point. So I'm, you know, to, to a certain degree, I must confess that this is speculation. So another one is, uh, how long will it take to commercialize that? Are you part of the commercialization process or? No, so I'm not. It takes but, to commercialize it, like if but, you have a startup and stuff. Like. Well, I don't have a startup, but I, I'm consulting. Um, uh, uh, I'm doing the consulting work for uh, for uh, at least one startup, and um, uh, this is uh, and of course uh, talking to others. Uh, there are other players, major players, who are interested in this that I unfortunately can't reveal. But uh, I'm personally not, com you know, pushing co commercialization. However, this is. Um, this is exciting because it's a it's a new angle, hardware angle for AI, and uh, so there is some activity there that um, people are um, trying to take this to um, uh, uh, commercial uh, space, and and it could it could uh, it could then accelerate some of these uh, improvements. It could really solidify some of the things that I've been uh, telling you about. Right. And this seems is really the next step for computing. Uh, it seems more promising. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. I've got one more question. That's mm -hmm. uh, These are very good questions, by the way. Now I see, is there some type of diode that can be used for generating random numbers? Uh, yes, this is also another uh, active research topic. You know, diode, for those who don't know, diodes are semiconductor devices where they are, um, uh, they use these electrons and holes for, for transport. They, you know, they conduct current in one direction and they kind of shut off current in the other direction. So you can take a diode, bias it in the opposite way so that it shuts off the current. But as you, you know, if you're familiar with quantum mechanics and quantum, you can't really shut off anything for good. 
there's always going to be some leakage and some random fluctuation. And, and uh, so if you try to shut off certain special types of diodes and they sort of can lead to these random events, then these could be used for um, efficient ways of building really uh, good p-bits. This is again an idea that we are pursuing. So, um, uh, uh, excellent, uh, uh, excellent question. So, uh, uh, let me take one more and maybe leave it to Murat uh, if you guys have time. When do you expect quantum computers to be useful for lots of practical problems? Well, as I said, you know, I was very, um, I, I um, was very gentle for quantum computing. I said that. I, I made this analogy where um, qubits are airplanes and p-bits are at best faster cars and bits are, let's say, ordinary cars. So this is a very optimistic and generous take on, on quantum computing because presently quantum computers can have only shown, have only shown good performance against classical computers on contrived benchmarks. Nothing useful has ever been done by any quantum computer that has ever been developed so far, okay? And this is, this is almost, there's nothing to dispute on this. And you see, yet you see this enormous hype on quantum machine learning, for example. Look, I'm in the business of hardware and p-bits, it's hard to get to a p-bit computer with more than 10,000 p-bits. That's where we are at today. If you use A6, FPGA, you use, what the best can offer, you know, you use the best of what can be offered by CMOS technology and we are at 10,000. Now, if I talk to a machine learning expert who is, you know, doing training BERT, then they tell me they need a billion parameters to train that. So there's a big difference, even for pivot, it's this enormous chasm between where we are and where we need to go. So with maybe MTJs, we can build a billion bits and maybe we can do something. With qubits, you're at 50. You can't do anything useful even with 54 qubits and even if you're allowed to solve any problem and you're talking about, you know, quantum machine learning, how it and how it's that's going to revolutionize the world. So let me just tell you, I can I want to be as gentle as possible that you're not going to be hearing quantum machine learning hardware anytime that does something useful anytime soon in the newspapers, but of course. You know, it's very, you have to be very careful when doing, you know, uh, and making speculations like this. If they find a good error corrected qubit, if they can build a fault tolerant uh, quantum computer, for example, there are ideas from Microsoft that pursue topological quantum computation, an entirely different paradigm, then these, these things can change. But right now, there is no evidence of that happening anytime soon. So um, uh, I guess uh, that's about a gentle take as I, I could give one. I want to be very respectful and I want to say that quantum computing is fascinating and uh, it's really different from peak computing. Peak computing will reach a cliff and will not be able to do quantum stuff at some point. But as I said, it's a very murky area. It turns out a lot of the things that are useful for you guys are doable by pivot. So, so as long as we make, you know, we make the world a better place, I guess, I guess, again, my analogy is you won't take a plane to go to the grocery store, but if it's five hours away, you might just do, do, do better with a faster car. So this is the sort of analogy I, I like to give on this topic between, uh, the, between P and Q. Okay, so, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and, and give the stage to Murat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Excellent questions. Think... You know, a wonderful audience. You know, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, I think uh, that's a great analogy. It, it was very clear. And definitely we need faster cars first in terms of the technology then the planes will come later and much later if ever yes, comes yes yes and uh, this one thing nice about this one you know we we didn't have almost no uh, no one left we started with the numbers we finished this is a niche topic but it means people really engage and they they like it and appreciate your time it was nice fascinating Thank you. talk Thank you. And we're going to have that on YouTube, and I believe more people will watch it. Uh, we have a good, decent number of subscribers there as well. And appreciate it. We hope to see you in Clubhouse as well. Thank you very much, Murat, for this wonderful invitation and these excellent questions. I appreciate everyone's time, and um, uh, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.